can't die and burn in hell fast enough for me. I don't know why you can't tell me why. Why'd you have to burn my Bible? Linda Patterson Slayton was born March 8, 1950. At the age of 31, she was living in an apartment in Lakeland, Florida with her two sons, 12-year-old Tim and 15-year-old Jeff, and was described as a wonderful and caring mother of her two boys. On September 4, 1981, Linda's sister, Judy Butler, stopped by her apartment to have a cup of coffee, but instead discovered something horrifying. As Judy was walking by Linda's apartment, she noticed the screen on the window was off. When she looked inside, she saw Linda's lifeless body. Tragically, Linda's 12-year-old son, Tim, also saw the crime scene, changing his life forever. Linda had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death while her son slept. For the next 39 years, this case would go unsolved and her killer would live free. However, that all changed in 2019 when the DNA taken from her rape kit was also used to begin the process of genetic genealogy. The genetic genealogist was able to discover a suspect and provide the name to detectives. Investigators then surveilled the man and retrieved his DNA from his trash to officially verify the match. Also, fingerprints from the suspect's unrelated arrest in 1984 matched the fingerprints taken from Linda's window ledge. In December 2019, her killer was identified as Joseph Clinton Mills, Tim's youth football coach. He had been questioned at the time of the murder because he had picked him up and drove him to practice and returned him home. He said he had only met Linda once when she had walked outside to thank him for bringing her son home, and so he never became a suspect. Later that same night, after dropping Tim off, he returned to the apartment and murdered her. He even continued to drive Tim places after the murder. After his arrest, he denied ever returning to her apartment or killing her. He spent two years denying his involvement until he eventually changed his plea to guilty. But he had the audacity to say that she had actually invited him to come back to her place for a good time. He said that he had arrived in the early morning hours and entered the apartment through her window. Once inside, he said that she wanted to take part in erotic asphyxiation and had placed the wire hanger around her own neck. He said that during the act, he had rendered her unconscious, but had regained consciousness before he left and said he only later learned of her death. Her sons were able to confront their mother's killer in court and asked him how he could have no soul or remorse for what he had done. They also told of the effect it had on him and his brother and said they spent their entire life always looking over their shoulders and would always keep a knife under the pillow, scared the killer would come back for them. Her sister and the granddaughter she never got to meet also spoke their piece. The coward never spoke to the family and instead only told the judge that he was a good person before being sentenced to life in prison. At the age of 47, Deborah Dowsel lived at 5356 Colony Meadows Lane in Sarasota, Florida and was a lawyer and businesswoman. She was described as a workaholic and always arrived at work promptly on time. On March 29, 1999, Deborah's co-workers became concerned when she was a no-show, as that was very unusual for her. Her sister, Peggy Thistle, had spoken to her the night before when Deborah turned down a dinner offer to work on her taxes. At that point, a former co-worker, Joel Seimer, drove to her home and was surprised to see her car still in the garage, a sliced window screen, and things out of place in her room as he peeked inside. When authorities arrived, they discovered Deborah's abused body in an overflowing bathtub. She had been sexually assaulted, battered, and strangled. The co-workers that arrived to her home that day later provided hair samples, fingerprints, and DNA to compare to evidence found at the crime scene. During the initial examination, semen was collected and preserved, along with male DNA found on the shirt that was found wrapped around her neck, but the case would go cold. 
In 2015, after researching advances in DNA, the sheriff's office reached out to Pear Bond, who created a snapshot photo using the suspect's DNA, which showed predictions of the suspect's ancestry, eye, hair, and skin color, along with several other predicted traits that the suspect may have had at 25 years old. Detectives used this information to identify potential suspects and ultimately identified 39-year-old Luke Fleming, who was 20 years old at the time and living at 5185 Magnolia Pond Drive, which was just walking distance to Deborah's home. Investigators surveilled Fleming and eventually obtained his DNA, which was analyzed and compared against the suspect's DNA profile, and it was a match. On September 16, 2018, Fleming was arrested and charged with murder and sexual battery with great bodily harm. He testified that he met Deborah at a bar in Sarasota and had consensual sex in his car before parting ways. He was later found guilty at trial after walking free for over two decades and given two life sentences. Patricia Stichler was born June 5, 1954, and went by Patty. In the early 80s, at the age of 30, she was the first female manager of the 21st Century Health Spa in Toledo, Ohio. At the time, Patty was living in the 5000 block of Brent Haven Road in Sylvania, Ohio, and was a divorced mother of three daughters. On January 2, 1985, her 11-year-old daughter awoke to find her mother's deceased body in the master bedroom. It was evident that Patty had been violently assaulted, and this is what likely woke up her daughter. All this occurred while her other two daughters remained asleep in the bedroom next to hers. Patty had a New Year's Eve party that was attended by 20 or so people a day before her death. Investigators would find no signs of forced entry to any doors in the home, but there were knife cuts to a shower curtain and window coverings in the bathroom where a window was found open. As her daughters grew up, they vowed to never give up on finding their mother's killer. The case stayed active through the years and was looked into again in 1998, at which time unknown male DNA was discovered. Patty's ex-husband, boyfriend, and other male friends were tested, but no match was made, which was helpful as they had each been assumed by others to be the killer. Then in 2018, when genetic genealogy was taking off, a genetic genealogist built a family tree and came up with a distant relative a couple of times removed who was possibly related to the suspect. That led to a biological mother, but she had given the suspect up for adoption, so the genealogist had to trace even further. In the end, the work would pay off and a suspect was found. His name was Michael Mellis, and he lived just six houses down from Patty and was only 17 years old when the murder occurred. He was not known by Patty or her family, and there was no reason his DNA should have been found inside her home. Soon after, he joined the Army but died in a car crash in 1989, four years after the murder, while stationed in North Carolina. Investigators said they were able to place him less than 100 feet from the victim's home within an hour of the time the police received the call on the night of the murder. While he never paid for his crime, at least Patty's daughters can now have some type of closure. Anne Sang Tai Pham was born in 1976, the youngest of 10 children born to refugees who fled Vietnam in 1975 on a 60-foot boat filled with 200 people. The family ultimately settled in Seaside, California, embracing their new freedom, not knowing that in the U.S. a gruesome attack and loss would occur. Anne was the first of the Pham children to be born in the United States. At the age of five, she was in kindergarten at Highland Elementary School and was described as shy, sweet, and thoughtful. On January 21, 1982, Anne asked her mom to allow her to walk the two blocks to school from their home in Seaside. Sadly, Anne would never make it to school and would be reported missing that day. 
Two days later, Army investigators were looking for a marijuana growing operation in the brush at Fort Ord, which was a U.S. Army post that later closed in 1994. They then stumbled upon Anne's body near a shooting range a mile away from the elementary school. It was later discovered that she had been abducted, sexually assaulted, and strangled. It soon became suspected that a soldier at the nearby base may have committed the horrific crime. But no evidence led them to anyone at the time, and the case would go cold for the next four decades. In 2020, a cold case task force reopened the case in collaboration with Seaside Police and submitted evidence for a type of DNA testing that was not available to earlier investigators. This is a groundbreaking case because it involved extracting the suspect's DNA from a rootless hair by Astria Forensics. This DNA profile was used for forensic genetic genealogy to be performed by C.C. Moore, who ultimately led investigators to a suspect, 70-year-old Robert John Leno. Leno was a 29-year-old soldier living about a block and a half from the Pham family home. On July 6, 2022, a warrant was obtained for Leno's arrest to be charged with first-degree murder. Leno was never on law enforcement's radar, and at the time of his arrest, he was living in Reno, Nevada. He was also in jail on a probation violation and had spent more than 20 years in prison for other sexual assault offenses. Both of Anne's parents have since passed away, though authorities have notified her surviving siblings about the recent updates. On January 9, 2006, a man wearing a mask broke into the off-campus residence of a 21-year-old Miami University student on North Campus Avenue in Oxford, Ohio. He robbed her at gunpoint, restrained and sexually assaulted her, and even revealed his face at one point. After the suspect left, the woman's roommate called 911. The victim was later able to provide a sketch artist's details of her attacker. Just two months later, a similar attack occurred about 50 miles away in Fayette County, Indiana. DNA recovered at both crime scenes were a match, but didn't match anyone in CODIS. During the second attack, the suspect again wore a mask, but never spoke a word because they would later find out the victim actually knew him and might have recognized his voice. The case then went cold until years later when a forensic genealogy company was able to work their magic. Authorities had reached out to Parabon Nano Labs, who took on the case and was able to identify the suspect's biological father. But this man was unaware that he even had a son, so the case hit a roadblock. Turns out, the biological mother had become pregnant during an affair, but believed that her husband was the biological father of the suspect. Eventually, the identity of the suspect was revealed to be Lloyd Wendell Ells. On December 9, 2021, Ells was arrested in Connorsville, Indiana, and a search warrant required him to provide his DNA. He had his attorney ask for his bond to be reduced because he has cancer and other serious health conditions and had fallen multiple times in jail causing injury. Soon after, Ells pleaded guilty to two counts of rape and aggravated burglary. Sixteen years after the crimes, he was sentenced to 17 years behind bars. If he lives that long, he will be required to register as a sex offender and go on probation. In 2018, tree cutters discovered a human skull in a wooded area alongside Champion Hill Road in Bolton, Mississippi. Upon further investigation, authorities were able to locate more skeletal remains that were partially burned, but they were never able to find a complete set. Also, while a cause of death could not be determined, it was revealed that the remains belonged to an African-American woman who was likely under the age of 30. Not much else could be learned due to only having a partial set of remains. In 2021, the Mississippi State Medical Examiner's Office worked with Othram to develop a comprehensive genealogical profile from the burned skeletal remains. The condition of the remains required additional steps to make the DNA suitable for advanced testing. 
Finally, a profile sufficient enough to begin genetic genealogy research was created. The cost associated with this case was funded by Mississippi native and philanthropist Carla Davis, who also led the genealogical research into possible family members of the Jane Doe. Eventually, a family member was located and rapid familial testing confirmed the identity of the Jane Doe on May 26, 2022. The remains belonged to 19-year-old Juanita Diane Roxy Coleman, who had been missing since April 1, 2016. She was reportedly last seen in the 1500 block of Diane Drive in Jackson, Mississippi. Her family had heard rumors that she had been shot to death, but an investigation into her murder is still ongoing.